we've had school groups here for a field harvest and I'll start in the morning talking about the ranch and what we do and I'll say, I'm gonna make a claim. I'm gonna tell you that I think that the way we do things here and the way we field harvest our bison is more humane and environmentally friendly than the average spinach you can find at your grocery store. And they, you know, look at me like, oh my God, this guy's nuts. What, like, what is he talking about? That's Matt Skoglund, Montana bison rancher, who we'll be talking to on today's program. This is Down to Earth, the Planet to Plate podcast, a production of the Radio Cafe and the Kivira Coalition. I'm your host, Mary Charlotte Domandi. We'll be back with Matt right after these quick announcements. Find your next job or employee on Kivira's new regenerative ag job board. For years, Kivira has connected employers and job seekers through a listing of job postings in the monthly New Agrarian newsletter. Now you can check out the Regenerative Ag Job Board, where employers can post their opportunities and job seekers can find their next step. Please help to get this resource up and running by visiting jobsearch.kiviracoalition.org, and Kivira is spelled Q-U-I-V-I-R-A, jobsearch.kiviracoalition.org. Kivira Coalition has built out a busy spring workshop calendar of webinars and in-person events. There's a Meet Business Fundamentals three-part webinar, an on-the-land gathering at Red Canyon Reserve near Magdalena, New Mexico, an aerated static composting demonstration in Cleveland, New Mexico, and more. Check out Kivira's events page at kiviracoalition.org slash events. And Kivira is spelled Q-U-I-V-I-R-A. Kivira Coalition, American Grass-Fed Association, and Holistic Management International are excited to announce this year's Regenerate Conference. Save the date, November 6th through 8th in Denver, Colorado. This year's conference, Innovating for a Resilient Future, will interrogate and explore data, technology, information collection and sharing, ways of learning and knowing, and the myriad approaches to fulfilling our ecological roles. Go to regenerateconference.com to sign up for the mailing list to be notified when registration opens. And now to our program. I'd like now to welcome Matt Skoglund. He's founder and owner of North Bridger Bison in Wilsall, Montana. Welcome to Down to Earth. Thanks so much for having me. I'm a huge fan of the podcast and thrilled to be here. Oh, great. Thank you. It's great to have you, too. And you've got such an interesting story. You are a bison rancher in Montana, but you started out going to law school and working as an attorney. Tell us a little bit about that journey. You know, I'd say it starts back in my childhood. I grew up in suburban Chicago, and ever since I was a little kid, I have loved the outdoors and loved nature that love of the outdoors and nature just grew and grew through high school and college. And one of the reasons I, you know, I, I guess two of the reasons I went to law school were one, every town needs a lawyer. So it gave me geographical flexibility. Um, I knew I wanted to live somewhere ultimately where you had great access to the outdoors and you could hunt and fish and ski and those sorts of things. And then I also had a big interest in environmental conservation work. So I went to law school, graduated in 2005, and then I clerked for a federal magistrate judge for a year in Chicago, which was an amazing experience, amazing person that I clerked for. And then I spent two years in the litigation group of a large law firm in Chicago, which I knew was not for me long term, but it was a good place to start. And then in 2008, my wife, Sarah and I, we got married, quit our jobs, moved to Bozeman, Montana, and I had applied for and ultimately got a job with the Natural Resources Defense Council, the NRDC, here in Montana. And I did environmental policy work for 10 years. One thing led to another and ultimately got the idea of starting a bison ranch. And then we got real serious about it and we started it from scratch in 2018. Your work with the NRDC, you were actually doing work on bison policy. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I worked on a variety of issues in my in my 10 years there. But but the main issue I worked on for sure, my, my primary issue was bison issues, primarily the issues affecting the wild bison population in and around Yellowstone National Park. What were some of the 
things you were actually working on? Like, were you working toward better bison policy or what was the nature of the actual work? Yeah, exactly. The Yellowstone bison issue goes back a, a long time. And, and the bison in and around Yellowstone National Park are managed by multiple state, state of Montana, federal and tribal entities. They collectively make up the interagency bison management plan and the, the rules of the IBMP that, that they change from year to year control how bison in Yellowstone National Park are managed. And so it was very much policy work trying to see, you know, ultimately trying to get better policies in place for the bison in the park, working to allow the bison in Yellowstone National Park to have access to more habitat outside the park. And a lot of it was really, really focused on win-win solutions that, you know, both set the policies up for success and the bison up for success. So, yeah, it was, you know, bison policy work. Was that part of why you decided to start a bison ranch yourself? Like, did you have a lot of contact with bison? Did you, like, fall in love with them? Yes and no. So it was it was very much a policy position and an office job. But I I fell, you know, head over heels in love with the species and just had this, you know, incredible fascination for bison that honestly has only grown since we started the ranch. Like I'm more fascinated by bison today than I ever have been. And then it was kind of random. I was craving to do something that was tangible, land-based, conservation-based, entrepreneurial, and on my own here in the greater Bozeman area. And I, I'm a big meat hunter, care a lot about food and where it comes from. And because bison were always on my radar, I, I literally read an article in the Bozeman Daily Chronicle about the National Bison Association having their summer conference in Big Sky. And it said in the article, it mentioned that they were, the bison industry was growing and they were looking for more producers. And I, I kid you not, I thought to myself, wow, that, that sounds so cool. I mean, clearly not for me as a kid for, from suburban Chicago, but for somebody that sounds like an awesome, an awesome opportunity or, you know, awesome, awesome job. And then weeks and weeks later, the idea was still just kicking around my brain. That's when I got serious about it. And I ended up reading Buffalo for the Broken Heart, the memoir by Dan O'Brien, who started Wild Idea Buffalo in South Dakota and is a hero of mine. And that's when we got really serious about it. So, so yes, my bison work at NRDC definitely put us on the path to starting the ranch, but, but there, was, there was some luck in there as well. Was there like a moment where you went from, well, this isn't for me, I'm a suburban boy, you know, to, yeah, I can do this? Yes, th there were two, two moments. One was as I daydreamed about the bison ranch, for me personally, you know, raising bison and, you know, um, giving a great life on the ranch and then, and then shipping them to get slaughtered somewhere, it, it just wasn't something I was interested in doing. And so in reading Dan O'Brien's book is the first time I learned about the modern day field harvest of bison, which is just, you know, reversing that process. And instead of shipping bison, um, you know, bison have not been domesticated. So shipping them is, is high stress. High stress for the animal, there's a humane piece of that, and it also, the stress negatively impacts the quality of the meat. Um, so you just, you just flip that and go out and kill the bison on the ranch, wherever they are that day. And so that was like the first light bulb moment of, wow, I didn't know that existed. That's the way to do it. I want to do this. And I also, I just met more and more people who were disillusioned with the meat industry and they you know they'd say hey I've, I've i've read michael pollan i've seen food inc and i'm just i'm done eating meat and i don't hunt but if my neighbor kills an elk and gives me 30 pounds of it oh my god i i savor every bite so i was like oh you're not you're not really done with meat you're done with the factory farming the horrible things we see of like these you know hog farms and stuff which i totally get it's it's horrific stuff so anyway, so, so that, that field harvest piece, learning about it in Dan's book, that was the first light bulb moment. And then the second one, I really don't remember when it, when it happened. It was, it was gradual, but as we were working on, you know, we put a business plan together and we were getting more and more serious, but I, I just felt like if you didn't grow up ranching, you couldn't be a rancher. And, and the more I worked on it, I felt like there was something someone wasn't telling me because I kept thinking, I was like, man, I, you know, Clearly, we're going to make mistakes, but 
I feel like we can learn this and do this. And meeting a couple people that uh, were involved in bison ranching and had no ranching background, that was a huge confidence boost for me. And yeah, it was, it was some point in the process where I thought, or it just, I guess, yeah, it was not a, not a one day light bulb moment. It was just a gradual thing. But one day it was, we can do this. We know we'll make some mistakes, but, but on the flip side, it's also, we have completely open minds going into this, which, which I think is very beneficial. So tell us about the kind of ranching you're doing. I mean, you're doing conservation ranching, bird friendly, you're connected with the Audubon bird friendly ranching program and all kinds of things. What does that actually look like? I'll, I'll start with a short answer from 50,000 feet and then, then that we can go, go more granular. But essentially, I mean, we're working with nature, not against it. You know, that, that's, how, that's how we view our approach to ranching. And so, you know, what that looks like is we manage our herd as one herd year round. We have the ranch cross fenced into several different pastures and we, we move the herd around the ranch so that whatever pasture the bison are in, every other pasture is being rested at that time. We don't use chemicals, we don't plow, we don't till. We are wildlife friendly, carnivore friendly, bird friendly, and ultimately, we are managing for biodiversity and, and, and we do it for two reasons. One, we love biodiversity. And as you know, the world is losing biodiversity at, a, at an alarming rate. So we manage for biodiversity because we love biodiversity full stop. And then two, the science, and I'm, I'm sure you know Fred Provenza, you know, the, mm-hmm. the, the science is increasingly clear that the more biodiverse your ranch is, the healthier it is, the more resilient it is, the healthier your animals are, and the, the healthier the people that eat their meat are. So we want this place to just be teeming with life, both from you know grasses and plants and wildflowers to bugs and bees and butterflies, birds, waterfowl. So really, we, we're, we're managing for biodiversity. What does that look like in terms of the way you manage water? For us, water management is pretty straightforward. We do not irrigate. So our water sources, um, we have one, we have a single stock tank, and then all of our other water sources are live water sources. We've got multiple springs, multiple ponds, a spring creek that goes through the whole, a very small spring creek, but it goes through the entire ranch. And we have some riparian pastures and a, and a water gap built, uh, you know, trying to protect the riparian pastures. And then because we have the ranch cross fenced into so many different pastures and we're rotating the bison through the whole ranch, our riparian pastures are, are doing well. The list of creatures on your ranch is, is pretty incredible. You've got sage grouse, pronghorn antelope, sandhill cranes, coyotes, mule deer, wolves, moose, mountain lions, elk, black bears, waterfowl, songbirds, many other wild critters. How do those, I mean, people, you know, wolves are a hot button issue for a lot of people. How do all of those different wild creatures interact with your bison? Are there any conflicts, any threats? What does that look like? You know, one of the great things about bison are that they do an amazing job defending themselves against carnivores. And so I know in the world of carnivores, there's a lot of emphasis and and rightfully so on you know, non-lethal coexistence measures like having range riders and guard dogs and fladry and, and other methods. With bison, um, it's really straightforward. I mean, they, they just do an incredible job defending themselves against carnivores. So um, when people say, you know, what's your coexistence plan for bison and carnivores? It's literally having bison. I mean, we, we, we have, uh, it's, it, it truly is. I mean, we, I've heard You know, other folks who are way more in, you know, deep in the weeds on the carnivore coexistence issue, you know, trying to teach cattle to act more like bison, you know, to defend their calves and and fight wolves off and and that sort of thing. Um, And so in our case, we're lucky. We have bison. They do a great job defending themselves. And, you know, to my knowledge, we have not had a single issue with carnivores. What are the bison's lives like? Like, what do they do in, you know, in the different seasons? I mean, you rotate them from one pasture to another to let the other pastures rest and regenerate. But what are, you know, what are they, I mean, it's a herd of what, about 150? 
Yep, exactly. And so describe what that herd's life is like. So, you know, right now it's, it's early spring and in a couple of weeks, the bison will start calving. So we'll, which is an unbelievably exciting time of year, waiting for that first calf to arrive. And then they'll, you know, have their calves largely in April and May. And then in the summer, they're grazing and um, moving around the ranch. Many times in each pasture, they have a certain spot that they like to bed down and hang out. And it's typically a, a high spot, like the top of a hill. And the prevailing wisdom is that they, you know, it's just in their DNA to want to look out over the landscape and see what's out there, you know, wolves and bears and other things. And then also there's a breeze up there. So it keeps the, the flies away. And then the rut or the breeding season goes from kind of the middle of July through the end of August. So then they're into the the breeding season and then, you know, fall, winter, and then it, it starts again. And so day to day, they're grazers. They eat about 3% of their body weight in grass each day. Good heavens. So they're, they're moving around a lot in the morning, grazing, and then middle of the day, they're often bed down, chewing their cud, relaxing, and then they'll get up and be grazing again in the evening. And one of the coolest things about bison is that their herd instinct is still extremely strong. So when I say it's one herd, it, it really is. I mean, they, they move as a herd, like when they're in a pasture that you can see from the house, You'll sometimes look out and say, oh, there, there's the whole herd. And that's so cool. It's beautiful. And they're moving around. And you, let's say you're doing the dishes and putting dishes away. And then not very long later, you look back and they're all gone. You know, so they, they really do move as a herd. What do they do in the winter? Right now in the spring, they, they'll start shedding their winter coats. And that tons of bison hair that's shed on the landscape is great for all sorts of birds and small mammals and other critters that use that hair to um, line their nests and dens with. Um, I've heard that, you know, uh, on places where bison are shedding the hair, bird nests are, you know, birds have a higher likelihood of success of, you know, having their eggs hatch and the chicks survive and, and that sort of thing. So, so they'll start shedding their hair soon and then they'll have their summer coats. And then in the fall, they grow their winter coats. And in the winter, you know, the bison have been here for tens of thousands of years. So they're perfectly adapted to this environment and to this climate. And so when it's, you know, 30 or 40 below, they're totally fine. You'll, you know, I'm sure you've seen some of the epic photos out there of a bison just completely covered in snow and, while they look cold, the reality is they're totally fine. Their, their, their coats are so well insulated that the snow doesn't melt. It just sits on top of them. And then one of their evolutionary adaptation strategies is their metabolism actually slows down a little in the winter. So they don't have to eat quite as much. Uh, but they're doing the same thing. They're, they're grazing and moving around and bedding down. Yeah. So you feed them hay what did they do in the entire rest of the history of evolution? Did they just like move to warmer climates where there was more forage for them? Great question. So yeah, so here we're feeding hay in the winter. They still seem to always be nibbling on stuff here and there, but but for sure, you know, the majority of their of their nutrition and their diet is coming from us feeding hay. And then yes, I mean going back a thousand years when you had thirty to sixty million wild bison, they were you know, they are a migratory species and they're, you know, they're migrating from summer range to winter range and going where the good feed is. And, and that depends on snowpack and recent wildfires and, and those sorts of things. And so here on our ranch, you know, obviously we started from scratch six years ago. And so we've tried to figure out like, what's the right number for us? And I joke, like if we had five bison, you know, we would never have to feed hay but we'd go bankrupt tomorrow. Right. And if we had, you know, 600 bison, our grazing season would be, you know, a handful of weeks long because we'd have, you know, we'd be so overstocked. So we think that 150, and it's, and, and it's actually fewer, from a grazing standpoint, it's fewer than 150 animal units because most of the herd is, is young. There's a lot of calves and yearlings in there. We think that that's the sweet spot of having a long grazing season feeding hay in the winter, but not, you know, bankrupting us and feeding hay. So yeah, so that's how, that's how we manage them here. 
What's the ratio of male to females? You know, great question. It's, it changes, <laughs> I should say it changes over the course of the year. And, and the reason I say that is we have two mature older bulls that, you know, are, are breeding bulls. But bison, they become sexually mature at the age of two. And so each year, like, like this year, come, the, you know, in the next couple of months in April and May, our yearlings are all turning two. And, and that's also the age that we, we wait to start field harvesting them until they're two. So at the start of the summer in June, there's a lot of two-year-old bulls out there. Um, so it's a very, I guess, very low bull to cow ratio. But then we're field harvesting those bulls over the course of the summer and the fall. So the, the ratio starts to go, I guess, up and up, you know, f- fewer bulls and more cows over the course of the year. Interesting. So you, when you talk about field harvesting, and you were talking about this a little bit before, you um, basically take your truck out into the herd and you shoot one bison and string it up on the back of your truck and drive away. That's the most humane kind of slaughter that you can do is what it sounds like. Yeah, we're very proud of our process. And I'll explain to you exactly how I do it. But we've had school groups here for a field harvest. And I'll start in the morning talking about the ranch and what we do. And I'll say, I'm going to make a claim. I'm going to tell you that I think that the way we do things here and the way we field harvest our bison is more humane and environmentally friendly than the average spinach you can find at your grocery store. And they, you know, look at me like, oh my God, this guy's nuts. What, like, what is he talking about? And I'm like, just, but just, we, we can talk about it later, but just, just, you know, hold on to that thought. And, and so they go out, they see me field harvest a bison, and we, which I'll talk about. And then, and then we discuss it later. And I'm like, look, if you're, you know, growing spinach or broccoli or whatever it may be, you know, you're at war with everything that wants to eat that spinach and broccoli. And on, and on larger vegetable or fruit farms, from a conventional standpoint, where there's lots of herbicides and pesticides and fungicides and the land's been cleared, I mean, it's, you know, a lot of wildlife habitat's been destroyed. And then when they go out to actually harvest whatever they're going to harvest, if there is a chipmunk or a bunny out there, they're, they're not dodging it. So the, I love the nutritionist, Diane Rogers, who says, you know, there's no such thing as a bloodless diet. Like we're all killing stuff in the consumption of food. So let's just start there. Um, and then, and then I contrast that with, with our bison where again, we're, we're managing for biodiversity. So, you know, the more bees, butterflies, critters, grasses, wildflowers, etc., the better. And then when it's time to kill a bison, I drive out the herds together and it's a close shot, like 10, 15 yards, a copper bullet from a rifle. I stay in my truck because you have a better rest for the rifle and the bison just tolerate you better from the truck than on foot. And it's a headshot and that bison, you know, is instant lights out. And so, yeah, it's, it's as ethical and humane as it gets and it leads to amazing meat quality. And we, you know, we feel strongly about it. So we have a whole page on our website. We post plenty of, a lot of photos of field harvests on our Instagram account because we are just all about transparency and connecting people to where their food comes from and just going back to this reality that like, if you're going to eat food, you're going to kill stuff. So let's try to be as thoughtful and intentional about it as we can. How do you choose which one you're going to kill on any given day? So typically, I, I very rarely go out there looking for like one bison. It's typically like earlier I was mentioning, it's, it's okay. I know today is going to be a two-year-old bull. And so we have the, the bison have ear tags and bulls are in the right ear, cows are in the left ear, and then all the numbers on the tag are irrelevant except for the last number, which is the year it was born. So this summer I would be going out there looking for a bull with a tag in the right ear that ends in the number two, because that means it was born in 2022. And it's really the first one that provides me with the perfect shot. And the perfect shot is a bison standing still, not grazing or, you know, taking a break from grazing, like its head's not down in the grass. There's not a bison in front of it. There's not a bison behind it. It's not standing on on a ridge. And then I guess, yeah, because I didn't go into it earlier to flesh out the rest of the details. It's a headshot with the rifle. The animal drops immediately. 
One thing that's really interesting because people always ask, you know, how does the rest of the herd react? The short answer is there's, there's no reaction from the herd. Like if you were on a hill a half mile away watching with binoculars and headphones on, you'd see my truck in the middle of the herd and you'd see a bison drop and the other bison, there'd be no reaction. You'd be like, what just happened? That bison just tipped over. Um, so they don't react to the rifle shot at all. Why not? I don't know. I, uh, you know, I'd say this a lot because you'll hear people give you answers to questions about bison with hundred, you know, they give it with a hundred percent certainty, which I find crazy because I, I always say, you know, until we speak bison, we we don't know. We can guess, and I I think it's from reading about bison, they're the largest land animal in North America, and so I, I mean, without question, the bison is the biggest badass on this continent. And like today in the backcountry of Yellowstone National Park, a mature bison could be, you know, bed down on the ground and a giant grizzly bear walking by and that bison wouldn't even get up. It would look at that grizzly and say, I I dare you. I I could kill you so quickly. You have no idea. And so my understanding is that, you know, when the train and rifles came west and, you know, the, the great slaughter of the bison in the 1800s. One of the reasons it was so easy to kill bison early on is because, you know, a mature bison doesn't have a lot to fear. And so they just stood there. But once the bison's down on the ground and the animals around it, you know, I think smell blood and, and see that it's down. It's it's different every time, but they almost always come over and sort of sniff and investigate. And then I get, as you said, I get the bison on the back of my truck. I bleed it and then I drive it to a different pasture where I then field dress it or gut it um, and then get it back in my truck and drive to the butcher shop where they skin it and dry age it and do everything else from there. And so there is somebody nearby who can do that processing. Yes, we have an incredible relationship with our butcher. It's called the Amsterdam Meat Shop. They're a little less than an hour from the ranch and um, they do a phenomenal job, incredible job of dry aging, cutting, butchering, wrapping, freezing, boxing. They know our animals very well. We have, I mean, you know, they've become good friends of mine, you know, personal friends and just, yeah, they do a really great job taking care of our animals. One of the things that's so striking about, you know, talking to you and looking at your website and everything is you really seem to love your work. What do you love about it? Tell us some stories about these days in these years that you've been doing this work? Oh man, there's so much. I think, I think one of the things that I love about it comes from the fact that I, you know, had three years of law school and then 13 years of office work and, you know, environmental policy work that's a lot of it's just not very tangible. And so for me, you know, the tangibility of our work, and I use that word a lot because it really is is something that I just love deeply about our work. Like I can look out today and see bison. Our ranch is protected by our conservation easement. It will never be developed. That's tangible. You know, when we see like, you know, coming up this spring, when we see nesting waterfowl and nesting birds, that's that's tangible. It's right in front of us. And then we provide amazingly healthy, delicious, environmentally friendly, nutrient dense meat, you know, thousands and thousands of pounds of it every year. I mean, just last week, I got a picture from a repeat customer when the boxes, three boxes of our meat arrived and he had took a picture of his daughters, his young daughters with the boxes and said, we are so thrilled to fill our freezer again. And I forwarded it to Sarah and I was like, man, I'm like, I just love, I love what we do. This is really cool and feels really good. It just feels satisfying. Like we've gotten to know a lot of our customers. So I think there's that part of it that's unbelievably satisfying. And then, yeah, there's just there's just certain moments spending so much time, you know, outside with the herd, you know, throughout the year in different seasons that, you know, there's just times like there are certain times on certain places on the ranch and certain days where the herd will be walking or doing something. And it looks like we've got thousands of bison and you're just immediately struck with like, man, what would this have looked like? you know, a thousand years ago when there were tens of millions of bison. And it just kind of stops you in your tracks. And then same thing in the winter. There there are times where in a snowstorm or certain light and the bison are walking towards you, 
I don't know. It's it's really special, and it it, it genuinely it, it doesn't get old. Like it it seems from my standpoint to get more satisfying each year, even when it's forty below zero or a hundred degrees above. Yeah, it's funny. The I'm not a fan of the heat, so the the really hot days those you just you just work through. Fortunately, you know we're up we're pretty far north here. Um, and we don't get too many hot days and it's dry. So it's, it's not that bad, but I strangely, I, I love winter and I love the cold. And so, you know, field harvesting on a really cold day, like I had one this, this past winter where just the temperature, not the wind chill, but the temperature was 19 below zero. And it just, there's something about it that it just like really locks you in to what you're doing. And you know, in today's world where we're, you know, particularly for me running a business, we're an e-commerce business. Pe- people place their order through a website. I have plenty of time in front of the screen and on the phone like anyone else. And so to have a day when you, when you go out and it's really cold, it just like when they talk about flow state where you're just completely focused on the present, your mind's not wandering, field harvesting a bison at 19 below, for me, it puts me there. And um, it's... Uh, I don't know if enjoyable is the right word, but it's, 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 it's very satisfying. I, I really like when I see, I have a field harvest date coming up and I see, I see we have like a major cold front coming. I look forward to it. And I should also just say, I mean, you know, there's a warm truck right there. I bring a thermos of hot water. You know, it's not like I'm walking four miles and packing out a bison by myself. So I want to make sure I paint the, the right picture. Uh, right. It's cold for sure. And, and you're out there, but interestingly, you know, when you're field harvesting, the animal's hot. So when you're handling the animal with your bare hands, your hands stay warm because the animal's hot. You came into this profession with the intention of doing conservation ranching and, and already knew a lot about it. When you look at the other ranchers around you in Montana, are they doing similar kind of work? Are they more in the kind of industrial direction? What do you, what do you see and what kind of relationships do you have with your colleagues? So for us, yeah, I mean, we, you know, obviously didn't come from a ranching background at all. And, you know, we came to ranching because of all of the environmental benefits that we, that we saw that it has. And, um, you know, here in, in our part of the Shields Valley, our neighbors are all multi-generation cattle ranchers and, and we've gotten to know them really well. And I, I have an incredible amount of admiration and respect for them and their ranches. Their ranches look, you know, they're, they're beautiful and they've been ranching, you know, their property for decades and decades. And so I'd say in the six years that we're, we've been doing this, I have a greater appreciation for ranching and the benefits that it provides, uh, a greater appreciation than I ever have. I mean, I just think about, just take Montana and you're talking about like millions and millions and millions of acres of ranch land that are providing just an incredible amount of wildlife habitat and winter range for elk and mule deer, pronghorn, nesting habitat for waterfowl and songbirds and uh, habitat for pollinators, you know, bees and butterflies. And so, yeah, I have a tremendous amount of respect and admiration for for the ranchers around us and all of the benefits that ranching provides. I think that, um, yeah, I just, I feel strongly about it. There's a lot of conversation about bison versus cows, and I've had people come up to me and say, nobody should be doing cattle ranching. Bison are so much better for the land. They're different animals, but what's your perspective on that? I love the saying, it's it's not the cow, it's the how, because the reality is these are managed environments. These are not wild animals, whether it's whether it's bison or cattle. These are fenced landscapes, and these are managed ranches, and so... You can have amazing cattle ranches and horrible bison ranches or vice versa. Again, it's, it's not the cow, it's the how it comes down to management. And so, yeah, I get, it's funny. I, I often tell people that I like on ranch tours, will spend more time, you know, defending cattle and talking about the benefits of cattle than I do bison because, because we raise bison, a lot of people come here thinking that we don't like cattle and they'll say, oh man, this is so great. You have bison we got to get rid of all those goddamn cattle. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, you know, hold on, stop right there. Let's talk about that. And then I explain what I just talked about and say, look, you know, look at all our neighbor's ranches. Those are all cattle ranches. They're, they're spectacular. And, 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 you know, a lot of the most progressive stuff in regenerative agriculture is being done with cattle. So 
you cannot, like anything in life, you just, you can't paint with a broad brush. It comes down to that individual ranch. And like I said, you can have amazing cattle ranches and bad bison ranches and vice versa. It just totally depends on the ranch. I mean, as you said, they're different animals. They're not domesticated the way cows are. What are they, I mean, you sort of, you talked about this a little bit earlier, but what are they like? I mean, do you see and feel the wildness in them? Great question. You're correct. You know, they're, you know, I'm a wildlife nut. I love wildlife. So I always make, make it clear that our bison, these are not wild bison. Yellowstone's bison, th- those are wild bison. That's a wild population of bison. Ours are, like I said, you know, a, a fenced, a managed population. Ours are a, a managed population on a ranch. But the, their, their DNA is the same as the DNA in, of the bison in Yellowstone. And so there, there are definitely things that are different with bison than other livestock species. Like I'll tell folks, if, if you're really into like hands-on animal husbandry, bison are not for you because you don't touch them. You don't, you know, you don't get close to them. You know, you don't, you don't get super close to them because they, they could charge you. They could, you know, they could kill you. And, and there are times where, you know, to directly answer your question, whether you see their wildness, absolutely. I think it's primarily uh, when we do pasture moves and day to day on the ranch, when you're out with the herd, you, you often see, you know, whether it's their agility or they often, I mean, even in Yellowstone National Park, they just, they conserve their energy, right? They, they spend a lot of time walking. They don't run unless they have to, but when they do run or they do jump, it's, uh, it's quite a sight. I mean, they're just, they're incredible animals. They can run very fast. They can jump very high. Yeah, they're, they're magnificent animals. Talk a little bit about the meat itself. I mean, you are, you are proud of the meat that you're serving to people for its health and its nutrient density. Do you and your family eat it every day? <laughs> we pretty close. We, I joke that we, we eat so much bison that I think our kids are going to grow horns. <laughs> uh, and I mean, it's delicious. It's, you know, to, to describe the meat, it's more like wild elk than it is like beef. Um, so bison meat, the meat itself is very lean, but there's fat around it. You just, what, what you don't get with bison, you don't get the intramuscular marbling that you get with beef. It's very lean with fat around it. And then, you know, for ground bison, they grind in the fat and it works great in any, any recipe that would call for ground beef. And it's just, it's very flavorful and it's often described as almost having a sweet taste to it. And so we eat just a ton of it, you know, pr- pr- we primarily eat a lot of ground bison because it's the most versatile. And every now and then we have steaks and our, our kids just absolutely love it. Your business model seems to be that you're selling bulk only. So one can buy a quarter bison, you know, butchered and or or a half or I guess even a whole. How did you make that decision? Starting out because we knew we were, were going to field harvest our animals and that was so foundational to our our ranch and our and our business selling by the quarter half whole bison under the custom exempt designation as opposed to field harvesting under state or federal inspection it's just a lot easier and more straightforward for us to make an appointment with the butcher field harvest a bison you know we we pre-sell it by the the quarter half whole bison and then once an animal is sold i can field harvest it take it to the butcher the meat is all ultimately stamped not for sale, you know, according to the custom exempt guidelines. And so that's why we started with the quarter, half, and whole bison is just making sure we were following the, the rules and the regulations. And then, you know, kind of interestingly, uh, and COVID certainly helped with this, there are just more and more people that recognize the benefits in buying in bulk. Um, you know, you can get really great food directly from farms, ranches, commercial fishermen and fisherwomen in Alaska and other places. You can get really high quality food at a less expensive price because you're buying in bulk. All it takes is a really simple uh, $150 chest freezer that you can get at any you know big box store and it'll change the way you eat. So um, I think that that understanding and knowledge of all of the benefits of buying in bulk has really spread. And I think there's a lot of people you know, both whether it's in Montana or New Mexico or in 
Los Angeles or Denver that want to feel more connected to their food. And so buying direct from a rancher who you get to know personally, we really try, I mean, like I said earlier, we're all about transparency and connecting, connecting our customers to where their food comes from. And so like during the field harvest process, when I drive out, I take a picture of the herd, you know, that morning after I kill the bison, take a picture of the bison on the ground, you know, nothing bloody or gory, but very clearly like that's a dead bison on the ground. And then once it's been skinned and cut down the backbone, take a picture of the bison before it goes in for dry aging. Um, and I email that to the customers the next day with a little description of what took place the previous day. And our, our customers love it. They feel really connected to their food. And like I said, several of our customers become friends of mine. So yeah, I think, I think, you know, there's a lot of benefits in buying in bulk. Do you have any thoughts about how you would like to see the food system change in terms of providing meat to, you know, to ordinary people who want to eat healthy meat? Yes, I think that the current food system in the U.S., without question, it fav- it favors large corporate multinational companies. I mean, something like over 80% of the beef consumed in the U.S. is controlled by four different companies. You know, you look at the fact that, you know, as we sit here talking today, there is not a country of origin labeling law. So, you know, a cow that's born, raised, and killed in Australia, eventually shipped to the United States, and then, you know, cut up in an American packing plant, can show up in your supermarket with a made in the USA label on it. And there's not a, there's not a single small farmer or rancher that I know that supports that. And yet, Congress will not pass a bill to close that loophole, because the system is set up to favor these large multinational companies with billions of dollars at, at their disposal. And yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's clear that the food system is set up to favor these large multinational corporations who have a lot of money and a lot of power through their lobbyists and uh, in Washington, D.C. And so I just I would love to see a more level playing field for small farms and ranches, small meat processors. Um, I think it would, you know, a more decentralized um, food system would would greatly benefit the country, and I feel strongly about it. You like to say, "Eat with your eyes wide open." Tell us what you mean by that. Sure, eat with your eyes wide open is a, a term we came up with here. That it goes back to our what we were talking about earlier. You know, the, the Diana Rogers. The, the, there's no such thing as a bloodless diet, and and I think that for me, where it I guess irks me the most is. You know, there's this huge push in, you know, eat plant-based, eat plant-based for the environment, eat plant-based for the climate. And the reality there is that one, as we talked earlier, we, we know that no matter how you're producing food, animals, birds, what something's dying, right, in, in the process. So there's no such thing as a bloodless diet. And then from a human health and environmental health standpoint, you know, you know large conventional monoculture, you know, corn, wheat, and soy farms in the Midwest – you know, ecologically speaking, they're, they're ecological nightmares. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're losing topsoil every year. They're poisoning rivers. There's a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. But this constant drumbeat of eat plant-based, eat plant-based, it's, it's a good thing. It seems to gain more steam each year. And where it's frustrating is, you know, you and I, this is our, these are our professions. We, we spend a lot of time thinking about this stuff and reading about it. But Your average person that's working and stops by the grocery store to grab dinner and they think, you know, tonight I want to eat right for the climate. I saw there were fires somewhere or a hurricane or what have you. And they go buy a vegan Impossible Burger because that's what the marketing has told them to do. It drives me nuts because that's that's exactly what they should not be buying. And so eat with your eyes wide open is let's have an honest conversation about food and all of the impacts eat with your eyes wide open, know what you're eating, and just just be mindful and aware of of what's really involved. You have some um, activities at your ranch, and one of them is a dinner in July. If there's anybody who's in or going to be in Montana in the middle of July, it's called Outstanding in the Field. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's this amazing organization out of, they're based in California, and they do do these dinners all over the world. And a good friend of ours here in Bozeman connected us with someone that worked there 
last winter, so a little over a year ago, and we put together a dinner last summer with this amazing chef from Bozeman, Eduardo Garcia, and it's incredible. It was 200 people. It's all outside. They have an outdoor kitchen. They set up this long table, so everyone's, you know, 100 people on one side, 100 people on the other. They were wonderful to work with. It was, it was yeah, just, just, just a really incredible evening, and they said they wanted to do it again this summer, so we're going to do it again on Saturday, July 13th. And there's a picture of these tables all in this sort of long curving line, literally outside with these beautiful white tablecloths. It's like a, it's like an art installation. Yeah. Yeah. Actually the, the founder and owner of Outstanding the Field, Jim, he is in, I'm not sure which came first, the chicken or the egg, but he, he is an outdoor artist. He does these like separate from Outstanding the Field. He'll do these really amazing, wild outdoor art projects. There's, there's definitely some artistry involved. Anything else you'd like to tell our listeners? I, I think that covers it. I mean, I would just say if, if people, you know, my email and phone number are on our website, northbridgebison.com. If anyone has any questions about anything, please feel free to reach out. I'm the one that, that gets those emails and, that, and those phone calls. So don't hesitate to reach out northbridgerbison.com is the website. Matt Skoglin, thank you so much for spending all this time with us. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. You've been listening to Down to Earth. We would love it if you would support this program, which you can do by going to patreon.com slash down to earth planet to plate, where you can sign up for as little as $3. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And also, please rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. The Kivira Coalition is a not-for-profit and a community network of ranchers, farmers, conservationists, scientists, educators, and many others dedicated to regenerative practices that produce healthy food, support meaningful livelihoods, sustain biodiversity, and remedy the impact of climate change. To learn more about Kivira and how you can support their work, visit kiviracoalition.org, Q-U-I-V-I-R-A. And finally, this show is a production with the Radio Cafe. You can check out radiocafe.org to hear back episodes of this show and also find all kinds of other shows on a wide variety of topics as well. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.